Wow. What we've been doing here uh, in this Holy Week, uh, beginning with Palm Sunday, a series called Countdown to the Cross. And we started with T minus eternity past, and then we picked up uh, T minus 33 years when Jesus was born, and then we made our way uh, T minus 21 years when he entered the temple at 12 years old, T minus uh, three years when Jesus entered into the ministry by being baptized, and, and then T minus, and we just kept doing T minus all the way down. And so we're now down to T plus three days. Here's what's what's happened. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday. That was T minus five days. And now on Monday, Thursday, that was just a couple days ago, it was T minus one day because the next was T minus zero, which was Good Friday. Jesus died. He was dead. They took him, put him in a tomb. They sealed the tomb because he was dead. But now we are, they they took that body down off the cross and then they laid it in the tomb. I forgot to click these slides. They sealed that tomb. I just told you all that. And then they remembered that Jesus had said on the third day that he would rise. In Matthew 16, it says this, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus had predicted his resurrection. That's why they sealed the tomb and posted a guard so that no one would steal the body. Nevertheless, on the third day, it was Good Friday, all day, Sabbath day, and then the first day of the week, Sunday. It's plus three days, just as he said. He must, on the third day, be raised to life. Now, he died on Good Friday at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. By 6 o'clock, according to Jewish time, the Sabbath day would be starting. You see, they didn't count time like we counted time. The day for them began in the evening at 6 p.m. and went around to the next. So it was evening, night, dawn, day. That was, we do it just the opposite. All right? We say morning, afternoon, evening, night. But they, 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 they did the opposite. And so Jesus was on, on the cross, and, and he died at about 3 p.m., and then uh, by 6 p.m., they had him in the, in the tomb. So he's dead. He was, on the, uh, he was buried by 6 o'clock, and then he was in the grave all day Saturday, and he was rex- resurrected on Sunday, just like Jesus said, on the third day. Not after it, not before it, but on it. You say, well, there wasn't actually full three days there. No, there wasn't. It's kind of like if you were to go into the doctor or go into the hospital, and you went in on Friday afternoon, and uh, you were there all day Saturday and let you out at noon on Sunday, you'd say, somebody say, how many days were you in the hospital? You say three days. Why would you say three days? Well, you were there for a part of three days, a part of two, and the whole of one, and that's why the scriptures, Jesus was resurrected on Friday. Easter Sunday morning. Even though it wasn't a full three days, it was on the third day. I want to resume with the story as we do our countdown. Now we're counting up, actually. It's a T plus three days. And Jesus, uh, in his resurrection, there seems to be some apparent problems to some folk. When you read the Gospels, and you read one Gospel, and then you read the next Gospel, you read the other one, you say, well, some of the things don't line up correctly. And there's a reason for all of that. That's because each, each one who's writing is telling the story as they recalled it. Not that there's any conflict. Everything they say is true. It's kind of like when you go to the movies. You ever been to the movies? Of course you've been to the movies. And you've been to the movies and you come out and you, you, you go to the dinner afterward and somebody you meet sits down with you and you say, oh yeah, we saw this movie. And the group of you start to tell them about the movie. And, and while you're telling them about the movie, the other person says, oh, well, wait, wait, wait. You left out, and then they chime in and they tell it. And, and then they say, oh, yeah, yeah, but, you know, before that, you forgot to say this. And then you continue with the story. And the person's a little confused listening to this because they keep backing up and throwing all these pieces in, right? And they finally say, Shh, stop, don't ruin it. I'll just go see it for myself, right? <laughs> That's the way the gospel writers are. Each one is telling the story from their perspective, and each one has a different perspective. 
Matthew is telling the story for the Jewish audience that Jesus is the king of the Jews. Mark is writing to the Roman world, okay? And so he's telling the story from a Roman perspective, how his audience would receive it. And Luke is a physician, and he is really concerned about the details of the physical human body of Jesus. And then you got John, and John is thinking about how Jesus is God who's come in the flesh to us. And so each one, as they tell the story, tell it with their their angle and their perspective, and they all tell us the truth. It is for us to take those stories and interrelate them and integrate them so they become one, one harmonious story of truth. I'm going to do the best I can this morning. I can't read every part of the scripture for you. It would take me longer than the hour that we have. But follow along with me. The key is harmonizing all these eyewitness testimonies, pulling them all together into one story. The resurrection actually took place sometime before 6 a.m. on the morning of Easter. Early in the morning, the text says, early on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, when you go to the next gospel, it says, and at dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Now, which was it? It was both. It's kind of like you're in a carpool, and you swing by to pick up one person, and then you swing by to pick up another person. So it is true. Mary, when she Well, she didn't have a camel or a donkey or anything. They weren't riding together. They were were walking. But but she went by and picked up the one Mary. Because we go on a little bit further in the Scripture, in Mark 16, it says this. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James. Oh, that was the other Mary, the Mary the mother of James. And Salome brought spices so that they uh, might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, Jesus, after sunrise, uh, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. So now we got all three. They're on their way to the tomb. And there is no contradiction. It's just the integration of the truths of what is going on on Easter Sunday morning. At that same time, while they're on their way, we find from Matthew that there was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven And going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and sat on it. I'd like to think of it this way. When the angel of heaven landed on earth, all earth shook. (laughs) And then he he, he goes over, and and some of the other gospel writers say, the guards there, were, were, they're in shock. They act like dead men. They can't move. He goes over, and he, probably with just a single finger, he rolls away the stone that covered the tomb. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Wow. Now, while that's happening, the girls are on their way, and they're thinking, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Good question. None of them can do it. And so as they make their way there, they arrive, and when they, look, they looked up and they saw that the stone which was very large, had been rolled away. Now that there's no question uh, how it's going to be rolled away. Somebody's done it for us. And so the story says, so immediately Mary Magdalene, seeing the stone rolled away, came running to Peter, Simon Peter, and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. Now, Now, that other disciple that Jesus loved is John. John is the writer of the Gospel of John, and he never calls himself by name. He always refers to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Third person, talking about himself so that he doesn't insert his own name. So here we go. She came running to tell Peter and John, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. He's gone. He's gone. It doesn't even register in her head that Jesus is resurrected. She's thinking somebody took the body someplace else. And so, the other women, though, they lingered on. Mary left, they stayed, and as they entered the tomb, 
they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right, and they, and, and they, and they were alarmed. Yeah, some of you have never seen an angel. <laughs> I haven't either, but I know this. Every time there's an angel appearing in the scripture, it's like, don't be afraid. They are powerful, awesome, massive. I notice here it says, young men dressed. These angels look like young men, probably to be a little calming, uh, not in all of their majestic, angelic glory that would, uh, like the seraphim, got a response out of them, like Isaiah, when he saw those angels, said, woe is me, I'm a man undone. I just don't got it together. <laughs> whoa. Well, they see the angel, and the angel says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where he lay. Oh, my goodness. But go and tell his disciples, Peter, his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he has previously told you. And so the angel is reminding them, this is what they heard. Go pass on this message. And so at that point, the other women hurrying away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. You ever had that experience? Where you've been like, whoa. How many have ridden a roller coaster? <laughs> There's that experience of trauma and joy. I, I like the dragster at Cedar Point. It's only over in like nine seconds. It's a total of nine seconds of adrenaline, rush, and fear. And then afterwards, there's that joy. I did it. <laughs> the women hurried away from the tomb. They were afraid, yet filled with joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mary's already told the Peter and John. And so Peter and John and the other, Peter and the other disciple, John, they start running for the tomb. But they were running, they were both running, and the other disciple outran Peter. John is faster on his feet than Peter. <laughs> I always hated 50-yard dashes. I was always such a slow runner. It seemed like I moved more up and down than I did forward. If you were to watch family movies of me. <laughs> Obviously, John is outrunning Peter. But there's something else we got to almost integrating, interrelating the text to fulfill the sequence of the story. What John doesn't say, but we're going to find from the other gospel writers tell us, is that Mary also was following along. Now, I'm sure she's not running with the speed of the other two because she ran all the way there to tell them. And now she is tagging along. I know that because she's going to arrive at the scene for the next sequence here. When they arrived, John and Peter, Simon Peter was behind him. Oh, see, he's slow on feet. And John is quick. He arrived. But John stops as soon as he gets there. And all he's doing is looking in. While when Peter arrived, he went flying right into the tomb. Isn't that just like Peter? He's a guy that, you know, always opened his mouth and inserted his foot. I mean, he was impetuous, he was impulsive, and, and that's the guy. He goes running right inside the tomb, and he discovers what he had already been told. Then the disciples <clears throat> found that the tomb was empty, and then they went back to their homes. They go back. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. This is what Luke says, and he went away wondering to himself what in the world had happened. Isn't that just like a guy? Bottom line, I want to know what happened here. He's not exploring, not, he's not inquisitive at all. It's just, it, it, okay, I got to find the body of Jesus. It's just like, I wonder what happened. Do you notice something really interesting? It still hasn't popped into their heads that Jesus is resurrected. He's kind of wondering, I wonder what happened to that body. I wonder if the Romans took it or maybe the Jews took it. Who took the body? And so he's wondering what had happened. And so, but Mary, she stayed there. Oh, she arrived after they left or she was there when they arrived and they left. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white 
seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They ask her, woman, why are you crying? And her eyes are just filled with tears. She's the one that Jesus had, you know, cast out the demons, and she had become to know the Lord, and, and she was, like, from the beginning of the ministry, she's one of the women that traveled in the, the group. Now, she, she, she loves Jesus, and she says, he says, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. She still hasn't got the whole idea that he is alive. So we have his very first appearance of Jesus. The very first appearance is to Mary Magdalene. And we find in John chapter 20, verse 14, it says, At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know or realize that it was Jesus. And Jesus says, Woman. Now, that's not a typical address today. You know, Jesus called his mother woman. I never called my mom woman. <laughs> that, that just really didn't fly, but the culture is quite different. It wasn't a, a derogatory term at all. It wasn't sexist, any of that. It was just what you said then. He says to her, woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? She's still thinking he was the gardener. She still doesn't know he's alive. She says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. And I will get him. She, she, wants, she wants to anoint the body with oils and do all the things that they did in that day and, and, and after the, the death of a loved one. And, and so she, she's, she's having this plea with the gardener, she thinks. And it was then that Jesus said, Mary. No, however he said that, it's like right now, if you were to play a recording of my mother's voice saying, Dennis, over the PA, just a recording, I would immediately know who it is. And my mom's been dead for a long time. If my dad were to say it on a video or a tape recording, and he's been dead a long time, I would immediately know his voice. Jesus hasn't been dead that long. And when he says, Mary, she turns around toward him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, teacher, teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God, there's something going on here where Jesus makes a visit apparently to the Father in heaven and then returns to the earth. Some theologians speculize that he enters heaven to take his own blood and sprinkle it upon the, the heavenly mercy seat, making full atonement for all mankind. I'm not so sure about all that speculation. All I know is he says, don't touch me yet. I still have to go to see my Father. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told him that he had said to these things um, to her. And she, she's just spilling her guts. She is so happy. She's just rejoicing. But on her way, before she does that, see, I, I got to integrate and interrelate all these stories. On her way, she hooks up with the women again. So the women hurried away from the tomb and they f were filled with joy and they ran to tell the disciples. And so when they arrived, so he's appearing again now to these other women. So his first appearance was to Mary Magdalene. Second appearance is to the other Mary and the other uh, woman that was with him. And, and so suddenly Jesus met them greeting, he said, and they came to him and they clasped his feet and they worshiped him. They worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. The second time he's told them to do that. There they will see me. And so they went and they returned to the disciples. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. Oh, I like that. To the 11. Notice it's capitalized. This is a group name. 
It's before they were called the Twelve. And even after this, sometimes they're called the Twelve. Now, they're even called the Twelve even when there's like four or five among them because it is a title for the group. And so when they returned to the Eleven, even though I believe not all the Eleven were there, but there were some other disciples, followers of Jesus in the room too, they return and they're telling them what they had happened, what happened in their lives. They've seen the resurrected Jesus, but they did not believe the women because their worms seemed like nonsense. <laughs> what are you thinking? Dead people don't rise, right? So it seemed to them like nonsense. What are you, what are you doing here? What are you, you're trying to pull a fast one on us here? Even the disciples at this point, even knowing Jesus said, on the third day, I will rise from the dead. Now, there's a third appearance. While that's going on, Jesus is going to appear to two disciples on the Emmaus Road. And so on the Emmaus Road, Jesus is walking along. There's these two, actually, there's two disciples that are walking along, and they are down. They're, they're depressed. Uh, all their hopes have been dashed. The Messiah has been crucified. And they're walking along, and the two were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. <laughs> it's kind of like God put spiritual blinders on their eyes. And so here Jesus is walking along with these two really depressed disciples, followers of Jesus. And I love this story. He asked them, what are you guys talking about? What are you discussing? And one of them named Cleopas, Ask him, are you only a visitor in Jerusalem? Now, why would he say that? It was because it was Passover. Every male, Jewish male, was required to go to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover. There's over a million and a half people in Jerusalem, and that place is just loaded, packed with visitors from out of town. He says, are, are, are you just one of the visitors that came to Jerusalem, and you do not know the things that have happened there these, in these days? <laughs> What things? Oh, I love that. Jesus is just playing along with them. Come on, spill, your, spill it out. Just spill it out. What things? He said, well, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet and powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. He's powerful in the word. He spoke with authority is what the, the, the gospel writer said. Not like the scribes and the Pharisees. He spoke with authority and with deed. My he healed the blind. He fed 5,000. He had power. He did deeds. And it was all before God and all the people. Everybody knew that he was this great prophet of God. And he said, and they crucified him. But what we had hoped for was that he was, one, was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Wow, are they blind. That is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. He shed his blood to purchase us. The Bible tells us it's with his blood that we have been purchased. He redeemed them. And we thought that he'd be the one to redeem Israel. And what more, it is the third day since all this took place. And on top of that, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of an angel who said he was alive. And so now they're really perplexed. This is what they're talking about while they're going down the Emmaus Road. And some of them and some of our companions went to the tomb. That would have been Peter and John, and they found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Wow. Wow. They're rehearsing the story that the Gospels have already told us here. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Wow, two things. It's foolish to not believe the word of God. It's the fool that has said in his heart there is no God. It's the fool who does not acknowledge the Bible to be the Word of God. How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe 
all that the prophets have spoken. You need to believe the promises in the word of God. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into glory? If you'd only read the Old Testament, you would have found that there is a cross before the crown, suffering before glory. And here's what I like best. At the beginning with Moses. <laughs> he started with Moses. I think he started right there in Genesis chapter 3 in the fall of mankind where God then cursed the serpent and said the, the woman's seed, the Messiah, would crush the head of the serpent even though the serpent bites him on the heel. And that is what happened on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. On Good Friday, the serpent bit Jesus on the heel. On Easter Sunday, Jesus crushed his head by rising from the dead, and he is victorious over death itself. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, I would have loved to have been there with them. I'd love to have just been a little, what, fly or a gnat or something, <laughs> listening to all how Jesus went through the whole Old Testament. I'd love to have been there when he got to Isaiah 53, where it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him, Messiah, the iniquity of us all. I'd like to have been there to hear him how he explained uh, Isaiah 53, 10. And the Lord made his soul an offering for sin. And, and a little bit further in there, that, that he would be, live after his death to see his own seed or his own children, those who believe. I, I just love to have heard him tell all of that. And, and then you get to places like Zechariah 14. How Messiah is going to return again one day and, and he's going to set up a kingdom that's going to last for a thousand years according to the New Testament. Wow. Jesus is unfolding for them the, the, the Bible. And I'd love to have heard his explanation of the scriptures on everything concerning himself. And then Jesus uh, is getting towards their destination where these two disciples are going to stop Jesus acted as if he were going further. You know why he acted that way? He acted that way because he knew that they were going to stop and, and he wanted them to invite him to stay. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. And so he went in and stayed with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Now this is the most interesting part. Jesus is handing the bread to them. And what do you suppose they see? The prints of the nails in his hand. And it says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Whew. This tells me something about the coming glorified resurrected body. This resurrected body can touch and handle. It can talk and hear. It can walk. And this resurrected body can just, poof, vanish. This resurrected body can just whew, appear. I, I just, I, I love this. And you know, one day I'm going to have a resurrected body because I believe in Jesus. And if Jesus comes back before I die, it's going to be changed in an instant, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump, and I'm going to be out of here in a new glorified body. Whoa. Whoa. So they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. No, hey, wherever they were going, they said, this is not where we want to be, man. We're going back to see the 12 or the 11, whatever title they're going by now. He said, oh, we're going back. It's about this time, after this, sometime, that there's a fourth appearance to Peter, and there is not much said in the Scripture about this. In fact, this is it, and one other place in the Bible. Then the Lord has risen and has appeared the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon, which is Peter. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul includes this because he knows Peter and he's, he, he's talked to Peter and, and, and that he appeared to Peter and then after that to the 12. Oh, that's leading us into the next one. His fifth appearance. All this is on Easter Sunday. It's a full day, a full day. The disciples had gathered in the upper room. They got up and they returned back to, to Jerusalem. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen 
and appeared to Simon. And they're all there gathered. And it says in John on, that, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Boo. He just appeared in the room. Whoa. He makes special note. The doors and the windows are all closed because they're afraid. They don't want anybody to know they're there. They're hiding in secret. Poof. Jesus is there. And while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. That's how Luke puts it. But back to John, it says, Now, one of the, the disciples was not there. And that one disciple was Thomas. He was not, with Jesus, uh, was not with him when Jesus came. And so later, the disciples are saying, Thomas, you should have been here. You should have been here. You missed it. And he's saying, oh, I don't believe you guys. You guys are messing with me. He said, unless I actually put my finger in the prints of his hand, and then unless I put my hand in his side where the, the Spirit thrust him, he said, I will not believe. There are still unbelievers and skeptics today in light of all the eyewitness testimony. It's very interesting that when those who are experts in giving witness testimony in courts are asked about the veracity of all this, they say it is just exactly how you would expect the eyewitnesses' reports to have been. Each one of them telling it from their own perspective so that you got to integrate it and interrelate it all back together. I don't believe it. I doubt it. Unless I can put my hand in that print, thrust my hand into his side. Whew. Easter Sunday is now over. But there are more appearances of Christ. A week later, the 12 are gathered, or the 11, they're gathered together again up in the upper room, and Jesus again appears in their midst. And he says, Thomas. He said, come on. Put your hand in my side. Come on. Put your finger in the nail prints of my hand. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Amen. He believes. His doubt is removed. He has seen Jesus. And Jesus says to Thomas, blessed are you, Thomas, because you have seen and you believed. But, but more blessed are those who have not seen and believe. <clears throat> Folks, we who believe are more blessed. Amen. Amen. Remember, he'd been telling him, go up to Galilee, I'll meet you in Galilee, meet you in Galilee. They finally make it up to Galilee, and Jesus is there. He's on the shore, they're out fishing. He comes ashore, and he's already got fish prepared for him, and he eats the fish. He's got a body that is physical and spiritual both at the same time. It is a glorified body. He appears again to 500 people at once, according to both Matthew and 1 Corinthians 15. We find that James, the brother of Jesus, you see, James was his half-brother, and he doubted, and he didn't believe in Jesus until the resurrection. Believe me, if my brother rose from the dead, I'd believe too. So he appears to his brother James, and James becomes the pillar of the church in Jerusalem because the brother who was doubter before is the brother who is now the chief champion and pastor of the great church in Jerusalem, which could have had as many as 20 or 30,000 members. Wow. He's seen again at his ascension in Acts chapter, 11, uh, chapter 1, verses 11, 1 through 11. Jesus is gathered with a, a group of disciples, and he's there, and he physically, bodily ascends into heaven. And then last of all, we're told in the scriptures that he appeared to the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 and 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15 8. What am I trying to do here? Why is this resurrection thing so important? that the Bible de devotes a, a chapter in each one of the Gospels just to it. And, and then the whole, all the epistles and, and all the rest of the New Testament is built on this event. Why is it so important? I'll tell you why our, our key verse. Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins. 
That'll be built upon in the rest of the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, He was made to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Peter will say, he died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. Listen, he was delivered over to death for our sins. He took our sins upon himself on the cross so that if I believe in him, my sin is paid in full. And he was raised to life for our justification. That's Easter Sunday. The Greek text, I I, I like to translate this. He was raised to life on account of our justification. Because that's that's the uh, preposition there. On account of. The idea is, if he hadn't actually made righteousness, actually procured it for us, God would have left him in the ground. But God was satisfied with his death on the cross so that the payment was made in full, so that he had payment to extend to us righteousness, which we do not have. God raised him from the dead as proof that he has the righteousness to give to us. And the day I believed in Jesus, his righteousness was put to my account so that when God looks at me, he sees Jesus Christ's righteousness. Hallelujah. I am declared righteous, pardoned, forgiven, acquitted. I am accepted in him. Wow. Why is this so important? Because Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 say this. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You say it. You confess it. But it's coming from a heart. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You actually believe it, so you confess that he is your Lord. He is the one who saves you. He's your Redeemer. You will be saved. Saved from what? All your sin, all its consequences, all your pain, all your wrongs. You'll be saved. You'll be saved. You'll be saved. It's so simple to do. I was eight years old. And I responded to an invitation to accept Jesus. And the man just led me in a simple prayer. And I just prayed, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and cleanse me. Take away my sins. And he did. Because he is alive. He is risen. He is risen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, perhaps there's somewhere here in this room, someone here that that needs to do just as I did as a little boy. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and it was my sin you took on the cross. I believe you died for it, you were buried, and that you rose again. I believe that with all my heart and I am confessing you as my Savior and Lord right now. Father, I know if anyone prays anything like that and truly means it in their heart, that you will change them from the inside out because they will be saved. They won't have to work at changing. You will change them immediately. They'll have a desire for the things that you have a desire for. They will stumble and fall, but they will always come back because they will have been born of God, a child of God. We pray that everyone in this room will have called upon Christ at some time, that they might experience forgiveness of sins and the beginning of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray.